So hello everyone, I'm Ana Alonso Serrano from Bravlitz Activity Team and today I have the pleasure to interview Professor Stefano Liberati. Thank you for accepting our invitation to participate. So Stefano is full professor at CISA and director of the IFPU and also the president of the Italian Society for General Relativity and Gravitation. So as a brief summary of uh, the career, he studied the PhD in CISA and after that went for a postdoc to Maryland to come uh, to CISA after a few years as uh, an assistant professor and then uh, go to a, a full professor. So I don't know if you want to add something else here or I... No, thanks. I think uh, <laughs> as a presentation is for is enough. <laughs> Okay, so I think that my first question is, because you are going to explain better than me, which are your research interests? Well, I, I would say that my main research interest is quantum gravity phenomenology in different forms. Uh, in my, At least this is how I like to see it. Um, quantum gravity phenomenology is uh, basically a relatively recent branch of research that uh, developed, uh, let's say, in the last... Um, 20 or something years. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is to try a different approach to the problem of quantum gravity. That is uh, not just to try to develop uh, theories for quantizing gravity, but try to basically um, um, do a kind of a bottom-up approach. Uh, the bottom-up approach is the, is the following. is the idea that uh, we may not know what exactly quantum gravity is, uh, but we know what quantum gravity um, should do, uh, what problem it should solve, and uh, what kind of uh, new physics may lead at the, quantum, uh, the Planck scale. So the idea is um, to try to understand what are the mesoscopic effects, that means the effects that are uh, below the Planck energy that could be basically um, induced by the physics at the Planck scale and try to constrain them. So it's, it's an approach where you sidestep or you say it's complementary to the idea to develop a theory of quantum gravity. It's basically a bottom-up uh, up approach where you start to constrain or to devise experiment to test possible new physics that should appear between uh, our energy and the Planck scale in different quantum gravity scenarios. And uh, this can be declined in different ways, this kind of approach. Um, and in my career, I follow several, uh, several uh, uh, lines of approach. One, of course, uh, has to deal, has to deal, um, was dealing mainly with black holes, because black holes are the purest gravitational objects. And many of the new physics we expect to, um, to see uh, also due to quantum gravity may appear uh, in some aspect of black hole physics. And also, I have been interested in analog models of gravity, which are condensed matter system in which we simulate quantum field theory in curved space time, because they provide basically a controllable arena where uh, some of the phenomenology we could expect, uh, um, not just from quantum field theory in curved space time, but also from the effects of the fine structure of space time on uh, quantum fields may appear and may be tested. And uh, at the same time, also theories which uh, are entailing uh, this kind of new physics that, for example, may be suggested by analog uh, gravity models um, are being interesting for me also because also in this case, we can try to, uh, to gain uh, some insight about their prediction at uh, intermediate energy and try to see uh, how much we can constrain these new physics uh, with current observation of future ones. Okay, uh, that's a lot of material that now we are going to dig into. But first, uh, a very general uh, question. So why do you think uh, quantum gravity is uh, important? And uh, why this uh, phenomenology has emerged now and has taken so much importance? It's because of the possibility of uh, having some future observations or... 
Well, first of all, why quantum gravity is important? First, I would say that uh, as a physicist, it's, for me, it's not so much a problem of uh, reductionism. Uh, you know, it's not a problem of reducing that one uh, interaction, uh, the plethora of interaction that we are dealing with, a plethora, I mean, the final number of interaction we're dealing with. But the problem is, to me, predictability. We do have a uh, situation uh, um, in uh, the universe or inside black holes where... Uh, we lack predictability and where we need the quantum gravity theory. From, from the point of view of a physicist, I think that uh, that should be the main uh, uh, propeller. We know that uh, at some point we have to face the compatibility of quantum physics with uh, gravitation. Um, and we also know somehow that we don't understand very much of that in the sense that we don't even know... Um, how, I mean, there is still a matter of debate if gravity has to be quantized or if it has to be quantized, which kind of meaning should do, should we give to this quantization? Um, probably we will touch it later, but, you know, you may ask yourself if the fundamental structure are quantum, uh, um, a quanta of, of space-time, or if you like, if our gravitons are the fundamental uh, particle, or these are uh, more like phonons in a fluid, in the sense that you quantize uh, uh, in hydrodynamic, you have uh, you can give a well-defined meanings to the concept of phonons. Nonetheless, you don't think that these are uh, fundamental objects. These are uh, um, um, collective excitation of the substratum. And then you may have a more fundamental theory underlying this. I would say that any theories nowadays of quantum gravity where, in a sense, discreteness and quantumness discreteness is fundamental. It's not a, you know, a kind of uh, scale that you put there to regulate the infinities and do your calculation and then you remove it. It's not a computational artifact, but it's a fundamental uh, aspect of, uh, of reality. Then in a certain sense, always space-time will be an emergent. A continuous classical space-time will be an emergent concept. So at that point, in a certain sense, you have to face uh, what what is the meaning you give to the quantization of this space time, and what is uh, that you really um, what is the the deepest uh, uh, degree of reality that you can explore. So from this point of view, I think that uh, definitely we need um, uh, we need quantum gravity, and the point is that we can start say something. We can start saying what quantum gravity may entail and may not entail because there are consequences uh, in different scenarios about uh, um, the quantum and discrete nature of space-time that uh, are giving different uh, prediction at the uh, sub-Planckian energy scale. And that uh, would basically in, uh, imply that uh, you can already now, and you ask, you ask me why now? But because uh, basically in the last 20 years, there has been uh, a major step up. First of all, in the energy scale that we can access, think about the uh, ultra energy cosmic rays, you get up to basically 10 to the 20 electron volt, which is uh, just eight order of magnitude below the Planck scale. Um, at the same time, we get higher precision experiment in gravity, also tabletop experiment. And at the same time, we had also the opening of the gravitational waves channel that allowed us to probe much more deeply the nature of black holes. And not only the gravitational wave channel, but you also we had the, the very large base interferometers observation, like uh, the um, Event Horizon Telescope that allowed us to image the black hole, to have a first glimpse of the black hole. Of course, that is basically mainly determined by the what is called the light ring of the black hole. So it's not really probing uh, deeply into the horizon, but you can still uh, cast some important constraints on the nature of the internal objects. Uh, with the current observation. So I would say that is more observationally driven, this uh, jump uh, and this, uh, you know, the, the fact that we are we have seen the dawn of uh, quantum gravity phenomenology rather than theoretically driven. And now that you mentioned it during uh, uh, this uh, reply, what is the fundamental structure that... Uh, it's underlying our theory. Is uh, this related with your ideas uh, for analog uh, gravity, like not only uh, using analog space-time just to test some um, features of gravity, but to 
uh, do a model for an emergent uh, gravity? Yeah, it's related to that. I mean, the point is that uh, in analog models of gravity, uh, let's take, for example, a superfluid. What you have is that if you look at the propagation of linearized perturbation on these superfluids, they propagate uh, like um, fields on a curved space time. Basically, the, the flow characteristic um, are translated into the fact that uh, linearized perturbation fields uh, a curved geometry over which they propagate. Basically, you have a wave equation and a curve this time. So this was initially used to test uh, basically um, quantum field theory in curve space time, because if you can quantize this linearized perturbation, you have uh, a, a mathematical you know, dictionary where you can uh, produce a flow configuration, for example, where you have a region from which sound cannot escape. And those would be basically the what we call acoustic black holes. And then you can look, for example, if you can quantize uh, this uh, linearized perturbation. Sorry, what does it mean, an acoustic black hole? It means uh, a region of a flow where the flow becomes supersonic. And then uh, um, basically um, sound waves cannot escape from this region. You can imagine a drain hole, basically where the radial flow becomes uh, uh, from subsonic, sonic at some point, and then supersonic. Basically, anything that will emit, uh, communicate with sound waves would not be able to communicate with the external uh, uh, part of the flow once it crosses the sonic horizon, because basically sound waves would be dragged down toward the drain um, faster than they can escape uh, from within, due to the fact that the flow is supersonic inside the drain uh, from some point on. So. It, this is in strict analogy with what we get with black hole, where basically once you cross the horizon, the trapping horizon, what you have is that uh, light can basically, even if it's traveling toward the exterior, toward uh, the exterior region, is dragged inside uh, the, the light concept, tilted in such a way that uh, you, you actually propagate it toward the, the center of the black hole. So um, this can be translated in a true mathematical analogy and if you make a meaningfully quantize this perturbation, you can have uh, uh, also the analog of Hawking radiation. But it's more than that. You see, the problem is that the, the system is interesting beyond that because uh, it has a microstructure that we understand. And for example, the propagation of this perturbation is similar to the one of light and curved space time, only at low frequency, at very high frequency, the fact that there is underlying the fluid uh, a discrete structure made of atoms modified uh, basically the velocity of this perturbation. Um, technically is what it is, the modified dispersion relation, but basically it means that they propagate in a different way, which can be supersonic or subsonic, depending on the T on the system at high frequency. And what is happening is that then you can test the robustness, for example, of Hawking radiation in this system against this ultraviolet completion of your theory. And this is interesting because uh, since the very early years after Hawking radiation discovery, it was objected that the computation by Stephen Hawking was strongly relying on the structure of uh, the space-time and the quantum vacuum at very high energy, arbitrary high energy beyond the plan scaling principle. So people say, is this phenomenon really robust against the eventual modification of the ultra uh, the space time at ultra short case. And now, thanks to analog gravity, we could answer that uh, at least in a setting where we can do the full calculation, so it is a particular UV completion, but we have learned uh, basically that the system, the Hawking radiation is robust. And we understand why. And the reason why it is robust makes us confident that uh, this will be true even for different uh, UV completion of the theory, or even for different scenario where the uh, ultraviolet nature at ultra short scale of space time could be different from the analog gravity system. Okay, so let me rephrase to see if I answered. So uh, analog gravity is uh, allow us to make uh, an analogy of our system in the lab where we can easily text, uh, test what is a quantum field in a curved background. 
and then it's a way to test how uh, classic gravity behaves with quantum fields, and then we can prove some of the results of uh, of this uh, um, regime, like it can be Hawking uh, uh, effect. But now we go to black holes and we will explain or talk more about what it is. But the fact that it's, uh, it's a limit also of a discrete uh, system in the lab allow us also to test the consistency of this uh, emergent phenomena from the fundamental structure behind and how robust it's depending yeah, on it bas so. Yeah, basically allows us to be confident that the prediction that we have done uh, ignoring uh, the quantum gravity structure can be robust. But in, in addition to that, uh, it can, we can use this system as toy model of an emergent space-time and try to understand in this system, for example, what would be the, how we can um, emerge a cosmological constant, like the one we seem to observe in our universe, or uh, uh, how is possible that uh, quantum, um, you know, the, the request of uh, information uh, conservation in a quantum process can be preserved in a process like Cauchy radiation, the so-called information loss paradox, um, as a natural resolution in analog gravity. And what one may see is that in analog gravity, basically what is happening is that uh, when you create the, the radiation that is emitted by the black hole, you actually um, have to take into account the subtle correlations between uh, the atoms of space-time, that means the atoms which are in the condensed space, for example, in a bose einstein condensate, which is a, a form provided, a typical model for a superfluid, uh, which is in, um, realizing the kind of uh, analog gravity system we have been talking about. And uh, this subtle correlation between uh, the uh, quantum degrees of freedom, which uh, we would uh, call the quantum degrees of freedom of the space-time, and the degrees of freedom of the Hawking quanta that are generated uh, um, over this space-time, the subtle correlation are crucial. You can see that they are crucial in order to reconstruct the full uh, information. In a certain sense, the answer of analog gravity is that if you work all in quantum filtering curve space-time, where you treat, treat quantistically the matter and classically the space-time, then you have a problem. If you treat uh, both space-time and matter quantistically, and you basically see the evolution of uh, the black hole evaporation on the full Hilbert space, the quantum space, uh, uh, treated as one, then you don't have a problem. So in a certain sense, the information loss problem from the point of view of analog gravity is an artifact of the fact that uh, you forget that there is a quantum nature of space-time. You basically do a limit in which you treat the space-time classically, um, which is tantamount basically to take uh, the expectation value of some quantum geometric operator on some uh, highly populated coherent state. And then uh, you basically forget about it. And uh, then you have a problem because basically you lose this correlation. You cannot keep track of them. And then at the end of evaporation, apparently you have just the thermal bath, which is a mixed state in the quantum uh, physics jargon, even if you started with a pure state. Uh, um, at the early time. So that is basically a resolution provided by analog gravity. And similarly, the cosmological constant also. In the cosmological constant in analog gravity is due to the fact that uh, when you form the condensate that you call space-time, this is never perfect. It's never true that all the atoms are in the condensate um, or in the excitation of the condensate. There are always atoms which are a kind of... Uh, uh, cloud of gas above the condensate. This cloud of gas interacts with the condensate and provide uh, an offset uh, to the vacuum energy. And that offset uh, is what you see when uh, you derive the geometric dynamics equation in this emergent system. Just one caveat, in analog gravity, the geometric dynamics equation, the equation governing the emergent geometry are not the Einstein field equation of general relativity nor are the equation of uh, a modified gravity theory. 
are different equations, but nonetheless uh, are sufficiently close to gravity in some system um, to mimic uh, some of the aspects and to be able, for example, to see that they will be endo or less with a cosmological constant. So, for example, the best we can do is that we can simulate a system where the emergent geometric dynamics is the one of so-called Noston gravity, which is a scalar theory of gravity, uh, which is uh, an ancestor, if you like, of uh, general relativity, was developed in 1913 by Gunnar Nostrom. Um, but it's very close. It's basically, the field equation resembles the trace of the field equation of, uh, of, um, of Einstein. Because I was going to ask you how far can we go in this analogy? In and in use it to understand uh, gravity and also in call it uh, an analogy. So it's an analog for uh, which kind of effects uh, you mentioned the gravitational constant or the the cosmological constant. Sorry, the, the Hawking radiation, but uh, it can be stand for so many different phenomena. Or it can be used for many different phenomena. Let's basically say that as long as you are looking at phenomena where you have a quantum field theory in curve space time and you don't want to deal exactly with the back reaction, for example, of particle production on a curve space time, which could be particle production as the Hawking radiation, as we said, or cosmological particle creation, uh, production in an expanding universe. These are all things. Uh, that you can easily simulate, you can simulate basically in fashion like processes. Um, as long as you don't want to enter in the detail of the back reaction that instead are relying on the geometrodynamical equations that, that we say are not the same as general relativity, then you're fine. Um, this example I made are an example in which you can do a step beyond and try to learn a general lesson about uh, what you would expect uh, if uh, space-time is emergent. So how the fact that the space-time is emergent from a discrete and quantum structure, uh, it can teach you basically what kind of lessons you may expect. Uh, and this was what I was referring to for, uh, concerning the cosmological constant and, for example, the information loss problem. Um, so they, I see them as toy models where you have a, a lot of control on the UV completion and you can try to extract, to distill some, uh, some lessons. Then there is a lot of activity now in experiments. So first of all, we have seen Oki radiation in a lab. We have seen um, there is an experiment which was carried out in Technion uh, in different uh, steps, let's say, but I would say that... Uh, um, basically, in recent years, it's been consolidated that there is a very strong evidence that it was actually observed, uh, the analog of Hawking radiation in, a, in a, an acoustic black hole generated in bose einstein condensate. Um, there have been experiments reproducing cosmological particle creation that are uh, undergoing the experiments now, for example, trying to uh, simulate uh, Uru radiation, which is another uh, typical effect that... Uh, has been studied uh, in this field. Um, there has been uh, in, uh, a lot of work also on super radiance uh, from uh, rotating uh, black hole. Uh, that we cannot simulate properly the full metric of a CAR black hole, which is the rotating black hole of general relativity. We can simulate a sufficiently close uh, um, a, a geometry which has sufficiently close uh, resemblance uh, to reproduce some of the phenomenology we expect. Uh, um, around the rotating black hole. And so these are all things that are helped us uh, to understand uh, to, you know, the phenomena better and to see their robustness as usual with respect to the UV completion of the tier. How much confidence uh, these uh, experiments give us to, the, uh, to confirm the Hawking radiation in gravity? Is it a direct, uh, I mean, it's a direct analogy that we can really say, okay, this uh, confirms uh, Hawking radiation or there are some... Kind well, of... What it was done was, I mean, first of all, the experiment was refined over the years. The first claim was uh, severely scrutinized by the community in nanogravity. Um, and uh, only after so, um, several refinements of the experiment and, uh, you know, um, um, a very convincing evidence uh, 
was provided that was accepted i think now by most of the community that we what we actually saw was uh, the analog of irradiation what they did was basically waterfall in a uh, bose einstein condensate where uh, the waterfall at some point reached the sonic point and then uh, you observe uh, basically the correlations in the phonons emitted by this acoustic horizon um, and uh, as you know, okay, radiation, you don't need to simulate exactly as large geometry, as large in the color, the color is enough that you have an horizon. And uh, basically, um, it was expected that to observe uh, um, a radiation of phonons so with a given uh, characteristic temperature. This temperature was confirmed. There was, I mean, there was a, a theoretical prediction and the observation showed that at least in one phase, of the emission from uh, this uh, moving through superfluid, uh, it was uh, possible to recognize uh, the structure of correlation and uh, the agreement with the expected temperature of the theory, um, proving uh, both that uh, most probably, I mean, I would say, personally, I think I trust at this point the result is, I think is robust and um, it is uh, really, an observation of the analog of okay radiation. And also it is corroborating what we theoretically had understood that it was supposed to be robust against the microphysics. And then you can understand easily why, because you see the scale that is determining the typical frequency of the Hawking quanta is the scale of the surface gravity of the horizon, which in analog gravity is basically the scale of the acceleration of the flow at the horizon. Roughly, um, this scale uh, is uh, a low energy scale. The scale at which you expect the the modification of the micro due to the microstructure of the space time, the fact that this is a superfluid and the underlying it, there are atoms, is a microscopic scale, much shorter. If there is the separation of between these two scales is very well defined, if they are an infrared scale and infrared scale. Basically, you have a modification, but they are suppressed as the ratio of these two scales, possibly to some power. And this is generically true, also, for example, in the cosmological particle creation. But of course, you can take uh, another step. So I started, uh, even during my PhD, working on analog gravity, but you can start saying, okay, but can we imagine that you have this modified dispersion relation, this UV Lorentz breaking, for example, that you have... Uh, uh, in analog gravity, you have it in uh, due to the fact that maybe quantum gravity set a preferred length scale and this breaks down Lorentz, Lorentz value. Then uh, what you would expect is that you have a modification of the dispersion relation. Again, the propagation of particle, of elementary particle at the Planck scale. It may look like you need the Planck scale physics to probe this modification, but this is not true. If you have, a, for example, threshold effects, uh, um, the structural effects, and normally what you have to compare is a scale set by the mass of the particle that you generate at the threshold uh, with, the typical, energy, with uh, the typical energy at which the Planck suppressed term becomes um, important. And you will find that uh, even if you have the Planck suppression, you can see an effect uh, at lower energy than the Planck scale. And that is why, for example, I've done uh, part of my activity was to use high energy astrophysics uh, observation um, and, for example, cosmic rays, the synchrotron radiation from the Crab Nebula to cast constraint on uh, ultraviolet uh, physics that would, Lorentz, would break Lorentz invariance in the matter sector of the standard model. And it's amazing what you can do with current observation you can severely constrain this Lorentz violation, which would be confining the at the plant scale in this in some of these models. However, we haven't completed the job because uh, some of this Lorentz violation, the one that uh, theoretically on a theoretical basis you would you would expect more um, possible, um, are not uh, completely constrainable because. Uh, of some uncertainty we have now on the physics of the ultra energy cosmic rays I was talking about at the start of this uh, conversation. Um, so there is a lot of to do also there. It's a very um, exciting time because astrophysics is becoming uh, such a, you know, an incredible test bed for, uh, for uh, physics at the landscape, which 
when I was a student, yeah. this was was considered science fiction. Super interesting times. <laughs> so in this, you are also like working, meaning like because of the uh, quantum underlying quantum gravity, uh, there is some uh, Lorentz violation, and then this uh, leaves some track in the low energy physics that can be measure uh, in certain regime in the current or future near future observations this is part of the yes exactly and uh, one part of this uh, uh of this um field which is not being very much explored is the part concerning uh gravity not just the matter set the matter set or now we have a relatively good constraint we don't have uh, such an equivalent uh, nice constraint on the gravity sector. We do have a constraint coming from the fact that at low energy, the one uh, of the gravitational waves seen by LIGO Virgo observation, we do know that the gravity and light travel basically the same speed with high, very high precision. Um, nonetheless, this is a very low energy observation. And um, we have instead a theoretical framework uh, which uh, it's interesting because it's called Orava Gravity, or, and there is a, a version for low energy, which is called the, the einstein uh, Gravity. They are slightly different, but they are related. And um, Orava Gravity has the very interesting fact that by adding an other field, uh, which can be written a vector, which can be written as a gradient of a scalar, um, is uh, improving the renormalizability of general relativity. Um, by modifying basically the propagator of the graviton at very high energy. And this theory is uh, um, technically called power counting, renormalizable, but uh, now it's becoming increasingly evident that it's perturbatively renormalizable. So it is a renormalizable theory of quantum gravity, albeit it is a quantum theory of, of, of uh, quantum gravity. Um, and it's interesting because... Uh, um, it is a, an optimal test bed for uh, testing of the effect of Lorentz breaking in uh, the ultraviolet in the gravity sector. And uh, one amazing thing is that in a theory like uh, Orava gravity, in principle, you can have infinite speed signals at high energy. And then you may say, well, but then there cannot be black holes, for example, in Orava gravity because uh, you have infinite speed signals. And they... Uh, you see, um, less, you know, very often black hole thermodynamics is considered the first step toward quantum gravity because in Hawking radiation, you basically have uh, an amazing uh, uh, conflagration of uh, fundamental constant. Uh, um, and it's considered really the first step in which you, you start to see quantum aspects of gravity uh, um, coming through. Um, and it's also a mystery, you know, because black hole thermodynamics is uh, um, the thermodynamical laws of black hole are actually laws of black hole mechanics are the laws of classical general relativity. Nonetheless, they become a fully consistent thermodynamical laws only when you have Hawking radiation. But Hawking radiation, there is an H bar, it's a byproduct of a quantizing matter over a black hole background. So to me, it's always been a mystery how, how general relativity has laws for black holes, which are fully consistent thermodynamical laws only if you have uh, quantum physics. How general relativity knows about quantum computer in curved space time? Um, and coming back to Orava, why this is interesting? Because Orava is a setting where you are basically taking a fundamental aspect of what we call uh, black hole. You know, black hole are a region from which light cannot escape. And why? Like, um, light cannot escape because basically the light cones are bend and bent the inward even if light moves at the speed of light which is the top speed that you can have and so it is strongly based on the fact that you have local Lorentz invariance apparently in addition to gravity that is that is, is twisting space time then you have orava gravity where you have infinite speed signal so in principle you have completely destroyed a fundamental pillar of black hole thermodynamics. You may even guess there could not be black holes, but then it comes the surprise. In Orava gravity, there are black holes, and these black holes have a structure inside the, the low energy horizon that would be the one that normally we call the horizon of a standard GR black hole, which is a, 
a universal horizon. What is happening? This theory has a preferred foliation. Space-time can be foliated in by uh, space uh, slides. And uh, these are piled up uh, in a preferred way. This is what basically provides the Lorentz breaking over area gravity. Now, the point is that, that one of these uh, uh, slices of uh, space wrap up on itself and create a compact slice. And then, of course, uh, given that these are slices of pure space, these are the slices on which infinite speed signals can propagate. But if one of these slices wrap up and becomes uh, basically a, a compact, then what is happening is that even an infinite speed signal, once it is inside that slice, will not escape from that region. So you have a universal horizon, and you have a, a reco you recover, even in a theory with infinite speed signal, a notion of black hole. Then the question is, do these black holes have thermodynamics? You may say, how is possible? Because you have uh, this completely different setting. Well, the answer, the striking answer is they do. They do have Hawking radiation. Now we understand that they do have Hawking radiation. This Hawking radiation is there because there is a universal horizon, but for large black hole is basically indistinguishable from what you would see in standard general relativity plus uh, um, quantum field theory and curve space time. And so you get a fully consistent picture and we are hoping uh, that we will pay, be able to recover all the laws of black hole thermodynamics. There, is, there are strong hints that this is doable. But then you see, there is a problem. A problem. There is a, another puzzle. You, we have taken away, it's like in a Jenga tower, you know. If you are playing Jenga, we are taking away a fundamental block like Lorentz invariance, and still the tower stands. So even if you don't like Lorentz breaking physics, if you don't believe that Rava gravity is a contender to quantum gravity, nonetheless, this is teaching you a fundamental question. The fundamental question is that what is really fundamental in black hole thermodynamics? It seems that it has to do with the fact that you have a theory of gravity that fundamentally gravitational theories are thermodynamical theories. And they must have black holes and then, uh, in a certain sense, then you question, is this telling us something fundamental about the nature of gravity? And we are back to square one. Maybe this is an hint uh, that, again, uh, this is an emergent system, because in a certain sense, uh, the thermodynamic aspects uh, are something we are used to see emerging from uh, something which has a substratum. If you can eat it, it must have a substratum. So that is, uh, to me, why independently if you trust uh, or uh, you like uh, as an approach uh, Rava gravity, um, which is constrained, there are current observations that are constrained, so there is uh, a limited range, uh, range of parameter that is still compatible with observation. Nonetheless, there is a range of parameter, even in the low energy regime, which is compatible with observation. So uh, I think that it's still worth exploring because it, it can... The, this kind of uh, theories can teach us something fundamental about gravity. And the fact that the thermodynamical aspect of gravity seems to be strongly embedded is also something that emerged very nicely from another field in which I've been working, which is uh, the space-time space -time thermodynamics approach a la Jacobson. I was going to ask you like that was a, <laughs> the extension that you have worked and it's related with the, what is the fundamental constituent that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, that is a derivation that Jacobson did for the first time uh, in 1995. And to me, is one of the fundamental breakthroughs we had uh, in gravity in the 20th century, I would say, in the second part, for sure. And um, it has to do with the fact that uh, basically Jacobson, what he, what he did it was uh, very simple. He said, OK, uh, the equivalence principle tells us that around each point of space-time, you can build a, a patch where space-time is basically flat. And uh, then what you can do is that locally you can uh, reconstruct uh, the system associated uh, to an accelerated observer in this flat patch, patch of space-time. And this observer, a uh, uniformly accelerated observer, will basically observe Uru radiation, the one we were discussing about. It will basically observe the thermal bath, the temperature, which is proportional to its own proper acceleration. Um, the Rindler wedge, uh, which is characterized by some horizon and uh, by the fact that it is characterized by a, a, 
a temperature that if you want uh, is a temperature which is shared by the all uh, all the uniformly accelerated observer that are asymptotic to the same uh, horizons uh, basically um it can be treated as a thermodynamical system and uh, the Jacobs can say okay imagine i perturb it i send some flux uh, of matter to perturb it and then i look at uh, the system uh, how it gets back to equilibrium. And then he applied basically the Klaus's law, um, which is uh, basically tell you that the temperature times the variation in the temperature is equal to the variation in the, um, in the internal uh, energy. Basically what you get uh, when by we, applying we that- our, our basic courses in thermodynamics, so. <laughs> yeah, and basically by applying this he, and using the conservation of the um, the stress energy tensor, basically the, the object encoding the, the matter flowing in the system, through the system, basically uh, he found out uh, the Einstein equation with a cosmological constant. And that was a striking result because it's telling you that uh, you can, uh, it's not just that in, in gravity there is horizon thermodynamics, but you can go back uh, from horizon thermodynamics to gravity. And, um, you know, Per se, this uh, result is very interesting, but it doesn't tell you very much about the space-time being emergent or not. This was uh, very nicely stressed in some works. Um, however, you soon realize that in the construction that Ted Jacobson did in 95, it was basically not looking uh, at possible, uh, possible dissipative effects, which are uh, uh, basically it was put into zero um, a term um, uh, in the equation that would be related to possible dissipative effects in the system. Um, if you don't put it to zero, and he later recognized that you don't, you don't need to do so, then what you find is that these extra terms tells you that there is a reversible Clausius equation, but there is an also a reversible part that you have to take into account in order to recover the Einstein field equation. And this irreversible part is basically uh, what is called uh, the Arthur Hawking tidal heating. It's basically, if you like, the balance of energy, which is uh, dissipated at infinity by an horizon, which has to relax uh, because it's shared by some perturbation. And this is interesting because, you know, when you have uh, this, uh, um, in the language of thermodynamics, this is what you would call uh, internal entropy production or a much bit. And uh, this means that there are internal degrees of freedom in the system. Uh, if I if I do a, a bunch on a on a table, you you eat the table. I mean, you don't just create waves through the table, and that would be basically the perturbation that is reversible. But you also eat the table because you you discharge some of your energy in internal degrees of freedom in the object. The Arlokin tidal heating is related to gravitational waves, to the dissipation of the shear of the horizon through gravitational waves. So it's telling you that, uh, of course, gravitational waves are not waves on the space time and they cannot be localized, although they carry energy, but they are like heat waves. They are excitation of internal degrees of freedom of, of space time. But so if you have a much deep, you have internal degrees of freedom. So the picture that is emerging is that space-time must have a microstructure. And this microstructure can be excited. Um, and again, this points toward an emergent structure. Yeah. Well, this is so interesting. So we are uh, taking a, a lot of time. So I, I wanted to bring uh, another of the topics that you have worked on. And we mentioned it a little bit during the talk that is also the phenomenology purely associated with uh, black holes. You also have uh, some uh, words purely in the yeah, black I hole. Mean, and um, there could be some uh, construction of regular black holes. Yeah. Yes, I mean, in recent times, uh, I mean, uh, now we have uh, this uh, wealth of uh, um, observation concerning black holes that uh, um, are uh, transforming basically speculation in something that uh, can be directly tested. Now, one thing that uh, we, um, we, we know that should happen in black holes is that the, at the core of black holes, you do have a region where quantum gravity must come into place. Now, all the models that we have nowadays of quantum gravity basically um, 
predict a sort of regularization of the singularity inside the black hole, mm-hmm. an evasion of the singularity theorem of Perros. This uh, regularization can happen in different ways. And uh, what we did uh, uh, recently in my group was to basically say, okay, let's imagine that we want to, uh, we assume that quantum gravity evades at the very last, you know, when you arrive at Planck density in a gravitational collapse, the, the uh, Perros theorem, and see how, if there is a catalog of the possible ways in which you can uh, uh, move away from the singular behavior. And we, we indeed, we, we were able to catalog all the possible ways and they are not that many. Um, so you get a regular black holes. You can get basically regular black holes uh, in two, in, I mean, there is more ways, but uh, let's say that for other reason, you can exclude uh, some set of solution, but the two most uh, plausible solution that are left are a regular black hole where you have an horizon and you have a core which inside uh, uh, simulates basically a, um, a cosmological space-time like the Zitter or an anti Zitter one. And um, from outside, it will look very similar to a standard black hole of general relativity, although it will not be exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And this is the striking conclusion that uh, if you want to regularize the core, uh, the standard law was that the independently of the way you make it, you will have no effect visible beyond the horizon. But this was assuming that the structure of the geometry of space-time that has this regularized core is basically separated, that you don't have a long-range effect. What you see in this uh, catalog of, of uh, you know, um, quantum gravity agnostic uh, resolution of the singularity is that generically uh, you can confine the effect to be very small uh, and so to have a very tiny vi- uh, deviation from standard general relativity at the horizon, but you cannot make them exactly zero. And uh, it, there are plausible situations that you cannot exclude a priori in which uh, you will have uh, a different geometry outside of the horizon. And this can happen because you have a regular core like the one I just say, you can have a bounce where basically um, which is a special case of the regular core, or you can have that inside the black hole, it opens up a wormhole mouth. And so on the other side, you have another black hole. Basically, you have that uh, if you fall into a black hole, you will, you will find uh, a wormhole mouth and you exit in a, in a, a twin uh, space time, which has the same structure of the black hole you fell in. Um, of course, you will not be able to escape because on the other side, there is another trapped region. So you will be trapped at the wormhole mouth. Um, but it's more interesting than that because, uh, um, first of all, these black holes have different phenomenology. You can look at quasi-normal modes of the react perturbation, and they have slightly different signals. So in principle, with the future experiment of third generation interferometry, we can cast constraint on these scenarios and on the scale at which the modification are. And so for me, it's just another case of quantum gravity phenomenology. Mm-hmm. But in addition, you see that the same solution that describes black hole uh, may have a structure in which the internal core can become so large to take over the horizon, and then they become ultra-compact objects. And so there will be the equivalent of ultra-compact star generated basically by a process that is originated by the regularization of quantum gravity in the Planck core. Now, you may say, why that should happen at all? Mm-hmm. Why? And one interesting thing, generic feature that we are finding is that when you have, for example, a regular core, you don't have only an outer horizon, you have also an inner horizon. Um, And this is to do with the fact that you have to basically, if the light cones are pointing inward, you have to undo this before regularizing the core. So you need another horizon where you you do the undo of the trapped region. Um, But this inner horizon, we discovered that is generic and unstable. And uh, there are preliminary calculations that are expecting this inner horizon to expand. So if it is expanding, you may get toward an, uh, what we call an extremal black hole or toward an ultra-compact object. But at the same time, we have also understood very recently that any ultra-compact object which has, uh, we cast a shadow like the one mm-hmm. we see with the, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, will also have uh, an inner uh, light ring, I mean, an inner stable, stable circular orbit for photon. And this would be generating an instability. So it looks like uh, 
these objects must be evolving and that there are a very constrained set of possibility toward which they can evolve. And so it looks like uh, even without knowing the detail of quantum gravity, just assuming the regularization of the singularity, you're basically going down a rabbit hole where uh, uh, the doors are closing and uh, you see that there are very few long living configuration that may be compatible with observation. And, and I find that as well, this very interesting because it looks like uh, uh, you don't have uh, a lot of freedom to play around and that somehow we may discover that there is one or two possibility of objects which are not standard GR singular black hole, which may be compatible with what we see in the sky. But then you may ask yourself, what kind of quantum gravity scenario will lead to mm -hmm. this? So that is, uh, and it's very nice this branch of it because you have a complete interplay with observation because nowadays we have so many data about black hole from black hole mergers, which are quite uh, intriguing. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, so fascinating, this field, and I think we could uh, talk for a lot of time about this and other questions. But I think that we are going towards uh, the the end, and I hope that we have uh, more news about this uh, branch of the phenomenology in the next years. And just to finish the conversation, I wanted to ask you a more uh, personal uh, question, and it's... Uh, in fact, two questions. Uh, one is what bring what was the thing that uh, bring you brought you to quantum gravity research, and what would you say to uh, a student uh, in the last year of bachelor or thinking about pursuing a career in quantum gravity? Well, uh, to me, um, it's about uh, it's about uh, the pursuing the final understanding of what is the, the fabric of reality, to say something like Deutsch, like David Deutsch, mm -hmm. is really the fact that uh, in a certain sense, uh, um, understanding uh, quantum gravity may be equivalent to, to make a giant leap in understanding uh, um, the structure of the universe and also maybe our place in it. I am, you know, this is far-fetched, of course. But in a certain sense, it seems to me that... Uh, Gravity, in spite of being the first interaction that we, we, we try to understand, if you think about the history of physics, we started with gravity. I think that, uh, or I think, I think it's evident that if we are going to end with gravity, maybe if there is an ending. If there isn't an ending, uh, still I think that uh, the, the deep nature of gravity has really something to do with, uh, with uh, the deep nature of what we call reality. And so to me, it's basically the most basic uh, path. But you see, to me, what is fascinating is that nowadays, we don't need to think of uh, studying quantum gravity as a purely theoretical uh, exercise. It's not, uh, a, 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 it's not anymore, uh, or does not need to be anymore, a branch of mathematical physics, which is perfectly fine. I, I mean, I am not I, I'm not against the, uh, purely theoretical uh, activity, but in a certain sense, it's not true anymore that you cannot start to have some guidance uh, about the quantum gravity scenario from observation. It's not true that it is a, a free meal, uh, that you can predict anything and it cannot be tested. Um, there are scenarios and that there are uh, theory of quantum gravity which makes start to make prediction and these predictions are not completely out of reach. If not now, in a foreseeable future, they are within reach. And I think that we haven't touched, but there is a lot of uh, possibility also from tabletop experiments beyond uh, what we talk about in uh, nanogravity, I mean, about the quantum, na quantum nature of gravity. Um, um, there is a lot of, of possibility also there. So if I would talk to a student now, I would say that gravity at large and uh, quantum gravity as a part of the full uh, gra gravity studies is a very exciting field. There is a lot to do, and especially young people, people that is you know going toward physics nowadays, 
they will see major breakthrough, I think, in the next decades. And they will uh, probably enjoy the possibility to put at the test uh, very far-fetched ideas that were uh, unconceivably, you know, um, um, far-fetched in uh, just uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. And nowadays are becoming uh, really something that uh, we can start to be to constrain and to get uh, an orientation. I'm not saying that uh, we are there, that we will get quantum gravity in the next decade and so on. No, it, it's going to be a long... Uh, but at least it's not going to be any more searching in, in the dark. Uh, uh, we start to have some light, some guidance, and we, we start to, to see that there is a pattern that we can follow. So good point. <laughs> So thank you very much for your time and for this amazing talk. Thank you, Anna.